Welcome to What's a Crime, I'm Linda and today we are on part 5 of the Charles Vallow series. I'm going to talk about the scene of the crime the day Charles Vallow was killed and some interesting points of that day. I'm also going to talk about what's in store for Lori Vallow Daybell regarding Charles's death. But before I get into it, if you'd like to be part of the It's a Crime community, please click that subscribe button below and hit that notification bell. Make sure you click it to all. Please like this video if you support it and share this out where you can. Now, let's get into it. First things first. Justin Lum of Fox 10 News made a post on Twitter that mentioned investigators are very close, which could mean six months or more, in charging Lori Vallow Daybell with conspiracy to commit murder in Charles's death. There are four search warrants out for digital data linked to Lori Vallow. Perhaps my theory on the coded email, maybe it's correct, which I believe that email is a conspiracy to commit murder, so hopefully that is part of the data and there is more of that. Hopefully they get Chad as well because it's my belief that he may be part of it. So in court last week with Chad Daybell, it was mentioned that Chad was in Chandler at the end of July. I believe Melanie Gibb mentioned that. So I have to refer back to my notes, but that would be a couple of weeks after Charles was killed. My bets are is that there is going to be some sort of history of Chad being in Chandler in the range of June 28th and July 11th. And maybe there's some interesting information that Chad was there on the day of Charles's death or in and around that time of Charles's death. So now before we dive into the scene of the crime, let's set the scene. Charles was living in Texas at this time, but was in Arizona for the last couple of weeks, according to a Gilbert Hotel employee. Charles wanted to pick up JJ at Lori's place, have breakfast with him at the hotel, and then drop him off at school. The school bell rings at 8.30 a.m. It was said that Charles had an appointment later that morning to go look at places to move. He texted Lori on Wednesday, July 10th, 2019 that he will be there at Lori's place at 7 30 a.m. the next morning. It's noted that Charles is usually punctual. Alex stayed the night at Lori's house and Summer Shiflet, Lori's sister and Alex's sister, said she asked Alex to stay the night. Notable what was said from Alex when Summer asked him. She said this in an interview. I asked Alex the day before Charles was coming if he would please go stay with Lori. He said, Lori is going to be fine. She can call me if she needs me. So this is interesting. Summer asked Alex if he could go over to stay at Lori's house. Alex said, Lori's going to be fine. If she needs me, she can call me. So this is insinuating that Lori would then have had to call Alex to invite him over if there wasn't already a plan in place, which I believe there was. So now as for that morning, Alex said he woke up at around 6.30 or 7 o'clock. He also said on body cam that this week he was on vacation. Lori said she helped to pack JJ's things when Charles arrived at around 7.35, 7.40 a.m., even though she said that Charles is usually punctual. It's my belief that the timeline had to be pushed back, as I mentioned in previous videos in this series. Tylee was also in the house that morning, but her statement said that she was sleeping up until 7.50 a.m. So on Thursday, July 11th, 2019, at around 7.30 a.m., Charles arrives at Lori's house, possibly even a few minutes later. Now, according to Alex, Charles had the bat and hit Alex with the bat. Alex says he turned around and went and got his gun. And then he shot Charles in self-defense. He said that Lori and the kids left first and he was left alone with Charles. Now, according to Tylee, she woke up at 7.50 a.m. and she woke up to arguing outside her door. She said she grabbed her bat, came out of the room, and Charles took the bat. She said she wasn't sure if Charles was going to hit her mom with it. 
Then Charles took the bat from Tylee and she reported that she fell down to the ground and Lori told her to let go of the bat and also for her to go out to the car with JJ. So Tylee goes outside and then she says she heard a loud noise she thought was the bat banging on the ground. Now according to Lori, she looked at the clock right at 7.30 a.m. Then she said she doesn't know if Charles arrived at 7.35 or 7.40 because she doesn't remember. She mentions that Charles is usually punctual and she was getting things ready for JJ when Charles arrived. Lori said he left with JJ and then came back because he forgot his cell phone on the counter. And then Lori said she took his phone and was asking Charles about texts on it. She said Charles and Alex were grappling on the ground and Charles hit Alex with the bat. She said she did hear the shot but she didn't see it. And then she said she left the house. She contemplated coming back in the house but then she decided to leave with JJ and Tylee. Now at 8.20, the police report said that Charles was shot. At 8.36, Alex made the 911 call and emergency responders are dispatched. 8.43, the authorities are talking to Alex Cox on the curb. And at 8.48 a.m., Lori and Tylee come back. Now let's read the statement by the Chandler Police Department. On July 11th, 2019, at 8.36 hours, patrol responded to a shooting call at 5531 South Four Peaks Place. An altercation ensued as a result of a domestic disturbance. One subject died as a result of the shooting. The decedent went to the listed address to pick up his seven-year-old son and take him to school. An argument ensued between him and his estranged wife. In an effort to defend her mother, a female juvenile tried to fend off the decedent with a baseball bat. The decedent took the bat from the juvenile and began swinging it. The shooter, decedent's brother-in-law, intervened and was struck with the bat on the back of his head. The shooter then went into a bedroom and retrieved a handgun. He confronted the decedent and demanded that he leave. Armed with the bat, the decedent moved aggressively towards the shooter, at which time the shooter fired at least twice in what he described as self-defense. The shooter was released after his interview, and this case will be reviewed by the MCAO. The case agent is Detective Moffitt. Okay, so in this statement, we saw almost everything that was said on this statement. It was also on the body cam. The only thing that I did not see on the body cam was the one comment that was made that he said he confronted the decedent and demanded that he leave. Now what we saw on body cam was Alex saying, I just went back in the living room then, and then he asked Charles, what is your problem? And he said, after that, that was it. So we didn't hear him say that he asked Charles or demanded that he leave unless it was redacted. Now what's interesting in this as well is right after the body cam footage of Alex, the officer goes to the other officers and relays the information and says, Alex told him to just get the F out, which I didn't hear that again unless it was redacted. But one thing we are missing is Alex's statement from the police station. But I do find this a little bit odd. And the officer says, Wife, husband got into a verbal argument. Brother steps in and says, just get the F out. At some point, the niece grabs a bat and is poking the dad. Dad takes the bat away. They decided to leave and everyone leaves. Now here's the synopsis statement from Chandler PD at 10.03 that morning. On July 11th, 2019, at approximately 8.20 hours, Alexander L. Cox committed second degree murder at and that's redacted, when he shot Charles Vallow twice in the chest during a verbal physical altercation. On July 11th, 2019, at approximately 8.36 hours, I was dispatched to, redacted, to investigate a report of shooting complaint. Dispatch advised Alexander L. Cox is reporting he just shot his brother-in-law, now identified as Charles Vallow. Upon arrival, I advised dispatch to instruct Cox to exit the residence with his hands empty. Cox then exited the front door with both hands up with his cell phone pressed against his right ear. I gave Cox commands to walk towards me and have a seat on the curb. Cox was fully compliant with my commands at all times. Officer Krautheim 
who was also on scene, stayed with Cox as I cleared the residence and made it safe for Chandler Fire Department personnel. Upon entering the front door of the residence, I made announcements for anyone inside to come out with their hands up and make themselves known. There was no movement in the residence at which time I entered. I observed a white male, now known to be Charles Vallow, laying on the ground in the living room. It appeared Vallow had been shot two times in the chest, as there were two 45 caliber shell casings to the immediate right of his body. I checked Vallow for a pulse, which was negative. I then cleared the kitchen and bedrooms in the southwest corner of the residence. In one of the bedrooms, I observed a two-tone 45 caliber handgun laying on the floor. I then exited the room and cleared the northwest area of the residence with negative results. I advised dispatch the scene was safe for fire personnel to enter. As fire personnel entered the residence, Officer Cohen also arrived on scene and stayed inside for her scene security. I then exited the front of the residence and began to put up crime scene tape to preserve the outer perimeter of the scene. The Criminal Investigation Bureau began to arrive, at which time I left the scene and met with Detective Moffitt at the Chandler Police Department main station. This concludes my involvement in this case. I have no further information at this time. See additional supplemental reports for additional case information. Now, as I said, we only have pieces of reports, of course. In one of my previous videos in the Charles Vallow series, I talk about all the police statements. We have one from Lori Vallow Daybell at the police station, as well as one from Tylee at the police station. We do not have Alex Cox statement from the police station. So now Lori and Tylee left with JJ to drive him to school. And in my previous video, I exposed the timeline. Lori had between 40 minutes and even up to an hour of that drive to discuss with Tylee what happened that morning and to corroborate their story. Now we only have what Alex said on body cam as a statement. Also, I want to note that the timeline that I did map out has Charles actually dead for a lot longer than 8.20 a.m. as reported because, well, math is math. And if Lori was actually truthful in the statement that she heard the shot and was in the house at the time Charles was shot, then there's no mathematical or logical way that she was able to drive JJ to school and back in time because she arrived back on camera at 8.48 a.m. Unless, you know, she took flight and flew JJ to school, even though she may think she's an angel, I don't think God gave her wings. Unless she found a new line of teleportation from hanging out so much with Chad and his portal potty. We also don't have a report on Charles from the medical examiner. Now let's take a look at the body cam where Alex exits the house and the officer goes in to secure the scene. So first take note of the driveway. Lori's place has a three-car garage and Alex has a silver truck which is in the middle of this driveway. The garage door is open on the left and an empty space is on the right. So I do wonder where Charles parked that morning. The logical thing or the most intuitive spot to park would be that right hand side so that he just quickly gets out, goes and knocks on the door, grabs JJ and then heads off. And remember, Charles would be on a time limit that morning. Go to Lori's, grab JJ, take him to breakfast at his hotel, then take him to school and be there before the 8.30 a.m. bell. Now in Tylee's statement, she said she heard that loud bang and then she said she had to run in through the garage to Lori's room, into her closet, grab Lori's purse and wallet because her mom needed it, and then came back outside and didn't see anything. So I do wonder if that's the reason why we see that garage door open, very likely could be. Side note, ladies, let's do a little poll and I'll do this in my community tab as well, but please let me know, do you keep your purse in your closet 
or your wallet, the one that you use every day, I'm not talking about backup purses. I'm saying every single day, do you keep a purse in your closet? I'm just doing a little poll. Let me know in the comments below, heck yeah closet or heck no. And go. Now, interestingly, Lori had no reason to take Charles's vehicle if Charles did in fact park on the right hand side because she would have easy access with her vehicle to back up. So she could have taken her own car unless Charles did park in the spot behind Lori's and blocked her vehicle. I kind of doubt it, stay tuned for that. But it makes more sense if Charles parked on the right. Also, JJ was seven years old at the time, so he would probably need to be in a booster seat. So did she transfer the booster seat to the rental vehicle? Did Charles have a booster seat in there? Or did Lori also drive JJ unsafely to his school? Just another X that marks the spot for Lori, potentially. Not to mention she did steal the car, which wasn't in Charles's name because it was actually owned by the rental company. Let's continue. Come out this way, man. You know, no weapons? All right, come on out this way. Yep. I'm gonna have you have a seat right here on the yep. curb. Yep. Who else is in the house? No one else is in the house. Okay, just have a seat right there. Let's get FD in here. Yeah. Have a seat. 18, seat secure. We got the gentleman out. Uh, have fire rolling. Okay, so you can see Alex come out of the house. He said there's no one else inside. Well, there is though, Alex. You know, your brother-in-law of 15 years. Charles, remember? So Alex nonchalantly walks out like it's just another day and you can't see it on here because it's blurred, but Alex has his sunglasses on his head. Now Alex here is about to talk to another officer in a moment and tell the cops on body cam that he shot Charles, then went to his bedroom, put his gun back, then decided to clean his head, then decided to call 911, then performs CPR or what I call pretend CPR, in my opinion. Then he walks nonchalantly outside, being sure not to forget his sunglasses after grueling time performing CPR. Now also in that scene, you can see one of the other officers have a gun pointed at Alex as he's walking out. Uh, I have fire rolling. Chandler Police Department, anybody inside, make yourself known! So the officer enters the house. There are shoes at the bottom of those stairs and we'll see that in a few minutes. And just to the left, there's something black in front of that mirror. I'm not sure what it is. If you know what it is, please let me know in the comments below. I'd be very, very grateful. So the officer then checks Charles's pulse. Charles is on his back and laid out with his arms beside his body. Now in the officer's statement, he says that there's two shell casings to the right of Charles. So since this footage was released, I kept questioning Charles's body position. If someone is grappling on the ground and they were having such a fight and Alex shot Charles in self-defense, would he be lying on the ground like that in such a perfect position? And I don't know enough about that to say either way, but I do question it. And would your arms be in that position or would they typically be supinated, meaning uh, palms up? So also in this footage, we also see the bat in the right hand corner. This also has me very, very curious. I was curious about the way it was laying. In my last video, I wondered if somebody actually hit Charles with the bat in the head. And of course we don't know because we haven't seen the medical examiner report. But then it hit me. With the police statements and the coded email I worked on in a previous video, their plan was to have their audience relate to their story, meaning the cops to believe them. 
which involved the bat. So I was thinking, well, what if someone swung the bat at Charles? Would it be laying that way? But if you bring in my theory again about having a plan to kill Charles, then in my opinion, the bat could have potentially been placed beside Charles on purpose to make it look like Charles had the bat. But there's a mistake in how it's laying there. However, if somebody wanted to place it there, they may be thinking to place it as if he was holding it at the plate. So they would put it there like that. This is just a theory. It might be totally wrong, but I was trying to think of if somebody hit him with the bat and then dropped it, that doesn't seem right. But then I thought it looks like somebody may have placed it there and thought if they placed it like that, it would look like Charles had the bat. But it's actually upside down because Charles would have dropped it and put it the other way. Let me know your thoughts. It's just a theory. It could be right. It could be wrong. Also, my thoughts are, why would Alex make the effort to put away the gun but leave the bat there? Because perhaps he wanted it, no, needed it to be there. And that secures his phone call to 911. He says, I got in a fight with my brother-in-law and I shot him in self-defense. And I find that such an unnatural statement to make to 911. It's a spur of the moment. Holy crap, I killed Charles Vallow, who's my brother-in-law 15 years, but he just says, I got into a fight with my brother-in-law and I shot him in self-defense. Unless he needed to secure his story, of course, by saying the self-defense on the phone and make sure he's not charged with anything else, right? So calm as a cucumber, but I'll save that call for another video. Let's keep going. So he walked through the main room and we see now that the area is furnished. Sofas, kitchen table, chairs. The other room was an extra sitting room type room and completely empty except for all the kajillion mirrors. Many viewers have been asking me about the furniture, but you can see the furniture is in the other area. We also see a toy, a Buzz Lightyear toy at the table. Maybe JJ was playing with it that morning. Interestingly, that chair at the end of the table, it is turned out. Back to the footage. Hey team, we got one subject down, apparent gunshot wounds in the chest. So there are three bedrooms and a bathroom in this hallway. On the left is the bathroom first, then the blue room, and straight ahead is the pink and black and white striped room, and then to the right is JJ's room. The gun is shown in the pink room, and I thought to myself, why wouldn't Tylee pick the pink room unless she hated pink? Not to mention, that blue room is super messy and there's quite a bit of suitcases and a bunch of stuff in there. So it almost looks like that would be the spare room or the guest room kind of where they kept some storage there. Now in Tylee's statement, she mentions one of the rooms as the guest room. Notable though, it isn't really that clear in the statement as to whose room is who. Let's have a look. It says, Tylee explained that the room where her uncle had been staying, the guest room, is right there where her room is, and then her little brother's room, and then the kitchen. Possible though, this is missing some punctuation. I did notice when I was reading all these statements before that there was some missing punctuation. It made it hard to read sometimes. So then it could read as Tylee explained 
that the room where her uncle had been staying, which is the guest room, which is the blue room, then where her room is, which is the pink room, and then JJ's room, and then the kitchen. Well, guess what? This is huge. Because you'll see coming up that the officer mentions that Alex most likely stayed in the blue room, yet we see the gun in the pink room. And then it hit me. Alex most likely wanted the pink and black and white room because that is the perfect spot to be on the lookout for when Charles arrives. Let's take a look at the outside of the home for a minute and you'll see why. You see the two big windows on the right. The left big window is the pink room. The right is the blue guest room and that one is inset a little bit from the other room. Just to the left, you'll see a smaller window and that's JJ's room. So Alex had quite the view, in my opinion, from that pink room. Perfect for when Charles arrives. Let me know your thoughts. Also in this segment, we can see the gun in the scene and Alex goes to the effort to return the gun to the bedroom and not back in its case and the bat's not touched. So I wonder naturally why not. Also, Alex said he woke up at 6.30 or 7 o'clock. Is that a normal time for him to wake up while he's on vacation? Or was he prepping for Charles to be there? I think we know the answer to that. And my other question is, did Alex only stay there for the night or was it longer? Perhaps that crazy messy room was that it was longer, potentially because he did have the entire week off or possibly longer and he said he was on vacation this week and Charles was in town for a couple of weeks. So why would Alex just come the one night if they were concerned? Now I wanted to stop right here as you can see Charles's left hand as the officer walks into the main room. I had wondered if Charles still had his watch on because you can see Charles in all his pictures and body cam footage, all those things, he's always wearing a watch. And I had wondered actually if Lori stole the watch right off of his hand. I'll cover that though, why I think that in another video, but it does look like his watch is potentially on there. Hopefully it's the original one. He's right here in the living room. Uh, Firearm is going to be in the front door, in the front bedroom, laying on the ground next to a case. Now you can also see in this segment the shoes at the bottom of the stairs and also the black object to the right that I was questioning earlier what it was. The officer then tells the other officer walking into the house where Charles is and where the gun is located. Then he starts walking towards Lori's bedroom which is at the opposite end of the house. Now what I'd like for you to do is to watch before the officer gets to Lori's room. He turns to the left and you can see a bathroom and you can also see a door. That's the door to the garage. Just make sure to pay attention and then I'll explain why in a minute. Now here's why I asked you to pay attention to this area, that's the garage. This is where Tylee stated she came from outside. She said she went through the garage, went to Lori's bedroom, into her closet to go get Lori's wallet and purse. Then we see Lori's bedroom, which is pretty neat and tidy. The bed is made. We go into the bathroom, maybe not as tidy as the bedroom, and then the officer leaves the bedroom. Now here's the area that piques my interest. The officer is walking out of the room and then he would have to turn right to go into the garage. Well, you can't help but see that Charles is lying on the ground there before you turn to go into the garage. 
and Tylee stated that she didn't see anything. She just went to the room and came back out through the garage and into the car. It's almost by default. You're not even meaning to look, but you turn and you go turn again and he's right there. So I do question that and I also question if those guys were already gone or if they were at the house because both Lori and Tylee stated they only heard one shot, but there was four. Unless it was a legit one shot and then Alex shot him three more times after they left. Back to the video. We know his name. Uh, we didn't have any of that as of right now. Right here, uh, I believe so. The firearms in the other room here. What's up? I can't. What you said? Yeah, I, I just did. Yep. I'm gonna go see if we can get this. You want to stay in here? I'll see yep. if I get this guy's info. Okay, so emergency responders are now in the main room and are performing CPR on Charles. One thing that caught my attention is one of the responders asks. This happened right here, fellas. And this could be a common question, but I'm wondering if the question was asked because it appeared that maybe it wasn't the same spot that it happened. Maybe the responder was asking, you know, is this where it actually happened? Because he was curious if he had been moved. Uh, for some reason or another, or if this is something he always asks. So it could be one of two things. could be one of many things, I'm sure. They also did ask, uh, check for an exit wound. So I have so many questions surrounding that, but let's continue first. One, two, three, four shots, something like that. Okay. Did you get the guy inside name? No, I haven't got it. Either. Charles is the husband of the occupants here. But I guess he lives in where? Houston. You know his date of birth? It's from Houston? Yeah. Is this vehicle here? How did he get her? Uh, is it here from Texas? No, that's my sister's car. I think he came in a rental car. I think my sister's in a rental car. One Paul 18. The subject that's been shot is. Now we hear someone say one, two, three, four shots, something like that. Now later that morning, this same officer with the body cam stated that Charles was shot twice in the chest and that was at 10.03 after this footage. So he asks Charles's name. I wish it wasn't redacted because in the 911 call, they ask his name and Alex tells him Charles Vallow, but spells it V-A-L-L-O. Oh, and that's interesting to me because Lori has had that name for almost 15 years and Alex doesn't know how to spell it, so he spells it V-A-L-L-O. But Lori lives in this house for all of three weeks. <laughs> Sorry, neighbors. And then he pretty much knows the address of it. He knows the house number and he pretty much knows the entire address except for if it's a lane or place, but other than that, he has no recollection on how to spell Vallow. I find that really interesting. Also in this segment, here's where Alex talks about Lori taking the getaway car, I mean the rental car. Let's continue. So the guy that got this Oh, 
copy uh, several gunshot wounds. Uh, There's a couple of shell cases behind it. Uh, right on the Probably. Many times. What's the cart? I'm sorry. And that's all we got because he's from Texas. Okay. So we don't really know much else about it. So the other officer says several gunshot wounds and the officer with the body cam states only twice in the chest in his statement around an hour later. Then the other officer says he was shot many times and there's redaction in this video but it also says he shot the F out of him, I'll tell you that. Now I don't know about you but the phrase several gunshot wounds, he shot the F out of him and shot many times is more than two, just my observation in my opinion. Then they talk about the shell casings. We heard earlier that there were two shell casings beside Charles. And we also see in the segment the officer carting the areas. I wasn't sure what it was and I saw in Profiling Evil's video that they were talking about it being two other shell casings. Now this is fascinating to me because this says a whole lot more. Profiling Evil, Mike and Chris, said that they talked about it being two guns potentially. I'm wondering if someone shot across the way where the window was and then execution style shot Charles two more times after the fact, after he was dead. So if that's true, there was a total of four times, like the officer said, and there's four shell casings, and that puts literally two and two together. Also, I'm wondering, if the casings are correct, and there's four, then maybe how Charles is lying, maybe it is incorrect. Because that would mean if the shots came from the opposite side to where the window was, wouldn't that have got Charles in the ribs and not in the front? Because of how Charles actually landed, it doesn't make sense. So my question is, was he moved? And again, I'd like to actually see the report. Which two were also the original shots? Was it the two from afar or two close up? And were those two close up, in Alex's mind, to make sure that the zombie didn't come back to life? Now, according to the statements, as I mentioned, Alex went to his room and got his gun. Wouldn't the shell casings be then right near the bedrooms and that hallway? and not over there near the window. Also, we do hear about the medics talking about exit wounds, being in the shoulder. There's a few things they say. I want to know where the heck the bullets exited. And did it actually exit his body and where did they go? Also, my question is, was Charles standing up when he got shot or was he killed lying down? Or what the heck happened? So many questions. Also, another thought. If the bat could have been planted, then maybe so were the shell casings. Maybe they wanted and needed the two bullets close to Charles, so it looked like close range, AKA self-defense. Just a thought, what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Back to the video. I'm going to see if there's a wallet or something in here, bro. I would, ima I would imagine he was probably staying in this room over here, I would think. Yeah, I'm just kind of looking for like a wallet or something that's got this guy's. Uh, yeah. yeah, something because we got nothing, man. Yeah, we'll probably remember. I don't know if they're going to carry it for him. Because it sounds like uh, 
dude's uh like a friend of the family or something. I'm sh I'm going off. So the officer is going on a hunt for Charles's wallet and it's nowhere to be found. And in one of my previous videos, I talked about how Charles would leave his wallet in his truck the day that Lori stole his truck. She seems to have a little bit of a pattern of stealing Charles's vehicles. So maybe he did leave his wallet in the car that morning and she could have very well had his wallet. We know she had the keys and potentially Charles's cell phone because she did mention that in her statement. One of the other things I thought about the wallet and I've been thinking about is, is this where Lori takes Charles's credit cards so she can use them in October to buy her and Chad's wedding outfits, wedding rings, bathing suits for Hawaii. All on Charles's dime while he's deceased and oh, she wasn't reprimanded for that either. Nor was she charged for fraud collecting checks for the kids. Perhaps that will come too. Now the officer mentions here that Alex most likely stayed in the blue room as I mentioned earlier. And then right here is the weirdest part of all the body cam footage in my opinion. I don't know why it strikes me as odd but right where the officer talks about the relationship of Alex and Charles he says a friend of the family or something. And the other officer says, well, he did say brother-in-law. And immediately after that officer says that, he says, I'm going off. It was just really immediate. I'm going off. And the weird thing is, I thought he was looking for his wallet. What set him off to say, ah, I'm going off? And he already relayed the information earlier to the other officers before entering the house. And he did talk about the relationship and he knew what the relationship is, so I just find that weird, in my opinion, just something I noticed. Because it sounds like a uh, dude's uh, like a friend of the family or something. Oh, I'm, sh I'm going off. <laughs> now I have one more page to read of a report. That's all I have though is just this one page. This is from Chandler PD. When making these observations, I did not notice any other blood in the living room. Due to the lack of furniture, there was no indication of a struggle and nothing in the room was damaged. Based on the lividity present and lack of blood spatter, there was no indication that Vallow was moved from the position in which he was found. Additional blood was observed on the faucet in the kitchen sink. Alex Cox had reported that after the shooting, he washed his hands in the kitchen sink. I noticed a small amount of blood near the aerator portion of the faucet. The blood was photographed, but not swabbed for evidence purposes. The residence located at redacted address had a master bedroom on the north side and three guest bedrooms on the south side. On the south side of the residence, I located a guest room that was pink in color and also had two walls that were painted with black and white stripes. This room was the furthest north room on the south side of the house. The room had a mattress on the floor with a fitted sheet that was blue in color. Lying on the carpeting east of the mattress was an orange duffel bag. Inside the duffel bag was a black hard sided gun case with 45 caliber magazines and ammunition. Lying on the carpeting east of the duffel bag was a brown and black Springfield XD 45 caliber handgun. After being, after being photographed, I handled this gun with gloves in order to make it safe. While inspecting the handgun, I did not notice any visible blood or biological material present. The firearm had a magazine seated and the slide was forward. The serial number on this firearm was noted to be, and it's redacted. I removed the magazine from the gun and noticed that the magazine indicated five cartridges remained inside. The magazine inside the firearm indicated that 13 cartridges could be loaded inside. I then manipulated the slide on the firearm and one 45 caliber cartridge ejected. This cartridge was secured as evidence. While at the residence, I placed a call to the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's Office. Investigator, and it's redacted, eventually responded and assisted with the investigation. During this time, Vallow's body was examined further and he was eventually placed into a bag that was properly sealed. He was then transported to the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's Office where an autopsy would take place. 
Prior to Alex returning, I made the decision to clean the large and that's it. I, and that was all there is of this statement. So it's stating in here that Charles was most likely not moved. What catches my attention in here in this statement was the mention of blood near the aerator in the kitchen sink. Now we didn't see it with the officer with the body cam because he didn't observe the kitchen sink on video, nor the other bathroom close to the kitchen where the hallway is with the bedrooms. Now why is it though, if this is deemed a second degree murder, that the blood in the sink was only photographed and not swabbed. So whose blood was it? Was it Alex's or was it Charles? Was this statement taken after Alex talked at the police station? Because we didn't hear Alex say, not once, that he washed his hands. He said he cleaned up his boo-boo on his head. And if that's the case, why wouldn't he do that in the bathroom? Just a question, why is he doing it in the kitchen? Also, the last line, which is partial, but it says, prior to Alex returning, I made the decision to clean the large, and large what? What did you clean? And was it submitted for evidence? I've seen many, many comments. People are asking, was the bat checked for fingerprints? How come there wasn't any further investigation on this? So many questions, hopefully we get answers. Now, there's a lot of info to process here, and there's a lot more to cover in my next upcoming videos in this series. Things are starting to piece together though, and I'm very, very happy to hear that the new detective on the case has charges coming potentially for Lori. Now, let's see if that old portal potty Chad was actually there as well. I got a feeling that he may have been, and I cannot wait. I cannot wait to see what the data is that they pull on Lori Vallow Daybell leading up to this. Looks like she needs to get used to prison and her new Kool-Aid makeup, in my opinion. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please like and please share. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon.